بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله My dear brothers and my sisters this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa As I promised today is my talk about practical help for Syria So much is being heard today and so much is being asked and so much is being raised and so much is being cried and so many dua and so much and so much and so much yet the situation is not about to change So what it is that we are doing wrong that is not getting us any records? When I was young, my mother taught me a lesson. That lesson has always been with me, and it is the way of the snake or the way of the chicken. It looks like the world, politicians and all those clever people, are using the way of the snake. But we Muslims, we can't stop from using the way of the chicken. The analogy goes like this. If you want to slaughter a chicken... If a chicken happens to be in a courtyard or in a stable or somewhere, all you got to do is walk. You start running off the chicken, the chicken makes an extreme big noise. And then there'll be too much dust in the air. And as soon as you grab the chicken and you hold its neck, it stops. And then when you lay it down, you can slaughter it peacefully and easy. No problem. Yet... If you walk in a place, in a field or in a yard, or in the same place where the chicken was, and you find a snake, why people are scared from the snake? It's because the way it moves, it doesn't make sound. And we don't know when it will attack. And the way it moves, it's very sneaky. So we Muslims today, we seem to always approach our issues the way of the chicken, when the world at large is using a snake. In these very difficult times where a nation is being exterminated by its ruler for no other reason than they demanded a better life with more opportunities and a better living and educational standard. At first, it was peaceful, just like it were everywhere else. The scenario is repetitive. The people raised against the government peacefully. The government refuses to oblige. The crowds get angry and start pushing forward. The police and army kick in to maintain order. And before you know it, everything gets out of control and people's lives get lost in the midst of it all. So how does the world respond to what's happening in Syria? The world is still divided based on old history, especially colonies and past invasions. For example, when something happens in North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. It's only France that gets involved. The whole complete world turns the head away. Why? Because that part of the world and any other places in the world where France has been already in the past, these places still belong to France. Quebec in Canada still belongs to France. Algeria, even though they call it independent country, still belongs to France. If you go to Libya, it's still Turkey, the Congo, Holland, the Middle East, England, and then United States. Egypt, the same thing, Americans and English, and so on and so forth. When something happens in India, when was the last time you saw the Americans involved in India? Ain't going to happen. That's because the world is still divided as it is before. Before there was an army you could see and you can fight. Today, the same army exists, but you can't see and you can't fight. There's no need to go any further. All is known these days. Everybody knows what's going on in the world. It's just, again, it always goes to the way of the snake and the way of the chicken. Western governments are working on all levels on how to advance their countries, how to give better life to their people, how to raise the living standard to their people. And to get to that point there, They are ready and willing to do anything that they can to secure that standard. Unlike our countries, Muslim countries, and uh, those third world countries or the seventh world countries, their main concern is not their people, but themselves on how to become richer, how to stay longer in power, and all that kind of stuff. And again, nowhere in the world, for example has a government branded a whole world of population, the whole country, 31.5 million of people branded them with the name of the king, Saudi. Your family name is no longer valid. You become a Saudi. Even though there is a hadith that prohibits this, 
yet it applies in Saudi Arabia. But uh, let's go back to Syria. One day I'll speak about Saudi Arabia. The demographics of Syria are as follows, like the people that live in Syria, because Syria is not one entity only. There are about six to seven to people, different groups of people that live in Syria. The Sunnis are about 77 to 80 percent that occupies Syria. The Alawiyin, and I will explain a little bit who are the Alawiyin. This is the ruling party and those small minorities that belong to the same sect. Usually they are extremely rich and well placed in the government. They are about 12 percent in Syria. Then there are the Duru's. Again, so-called Muslims, but in fact they are not. So there is about 3% of them. Al-Ismailiyah, the Ismailis, they are about 1%. The Christians, they are about 5%. And the Shia, about 1%. So these are the different groups that live in Syria. To really understand the conflict that is happening in Syria now and why is the world completely silent, you need to understand what really has happened so that we can work really with a big eye, the snake way, not the chicken way, the snake way that gets results. Even though it is not a kingdom on paper, Syria is ruled by kind of inheritance. Half of the Assad came to power somewhere in the 70s after a coup d'etat. And then when he perished, Back in the year 2000, in July 2000, his son was elected a president. Even though it is not a kingdom, Syria is ruled by inheritance. For example, the father, half of al-Assad, who came to the power through a coup d'etat, and I will speak a little bit about this in a bit, he came to power, and then in the year 2000, when he died, his son Bashar got elected as a president. Everybody just took Bashar. It's like a king leaving his son behind him. And Bashar became the president of Syria in the year 2000 until now. The Assad family is a Shia group called al alawiyun the Alawis, who believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh, is Allah. Now that it might surprise you, but that is what it is. To be accepted to the crowds and to the people, they changed from al nusayriya to al alawiyah The first of this deviated Shia, extreme Shia group, happened in 270 after the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by a man called Muhammad ibn Nasir al-Busayri al-Numayri who claimed prophethood and messengerhood. He claimed to be a prophet and a messenger and led this group to its formation. As mentioned, they regarded Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh, as a deity and to them Allah is Ali. They love they love a man who killed Ali. And you'll be surprised why. His name is Abdul Rahman ibn Miljam, the killer of Ali radiallahu anhu, because they, reg- they highly regard him and praise him and love him to bits because they say he is the man who freed the God from the physical body into being a God. So to them, exactly like the Christians, they believe that uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was freed from his human body to become the deity that he was uh, always been. They will attack and kill anyone who curses Abdul Rahman ibn Miljam. They will kill you if you insult him. Because how can you insult the one who set free their own God? They believe that Ali radiallahu anhu currently lives in the clouds, in the real clouds that you see high above you. And whenever they see a cloud passing them, they would say, Assalamu alayka ya Abu al-Hasan. Assalamu be on you ya Abu al-Hasan. They also regard thunder as his voice and lightning as his whip. So to them, and this is Bashar al-Assad, and this is what he believes, and so did his father. They grandify and veneer wine, and they also grandify and veneer the grape vines. To them, it's a divine drink. They pray five times a day, just like us, but there is no sujood in their salat. They have and believe in saints, just like Christians, and they don't believe in al-hajj because they consider that as an act of shirk because they say we worship a rock and we do a lot of things around rocks, like when we throw the pebbles and we circumambulate and all that kind of stuff. They don't believe in a zakat at all, but they pay a tax of 5% of whatever they own to their shuyukh, to their leaders. Fasting or Ramadan to them is not about not eating, just like we do. 
Ramadan to them is not approaching your wife for the total of the 30 days in Ramadan. That's all about it. Otherwise, in the daytime, they eat, they drink, they smoke, they even drink wine. That is not what is Ramadan for them. For uh, the Alawiyin, Islam has got two meanings. There is the clear, apparent meaning, for example, for us, Ramadan and what we think, but there is also a hidden meaning. And as such, they don't believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah the way we understand them. They don't also believe in as salah and they don't even uh, believe in al-zakat, the hajj. They don't even perform ghusl and they don't do wudu for their salat. Nothing of what we believe in is what they believe in. So they say they have hidden meanings and only them know them. And as such, they apply these rules depending on how they see the hidden meaning. Their faith and creed is a mixture from from all kinds of religions, from the Greek, Latin, they also worship constellations and the cosmology. They have Hindus in their religion. They have Shia, they have Christianism, and they have Judaism. All of them mingled and turned into something which they call an Islam. They also celebrate all kinds of festivals, including the Jews and the Christians. And they celebrate the 25th of December as the birth of Jesus, son of Mary, alayhi salam. And they also believe in saints. They also celebrate the day Umar radiallahu anhu was killed and they make sure that they show that openly and rub it in right in your face. So as you can see here, it's a lot of to take in, but that is what is the ruling party in this country here. This is important for you to understand so you can understand the next events that I am going to speak about. Ibn Taymiyyah alayhi rahmatullah says, هَؤُلَاءِ الْقَوْمُ الْمُسَمَّوْنَ بِالنَّصِيرِيَّةِ These people that call themselves النَّصِيرِيَّةِ هُمْ and, the, and him, them, and anyone who claims to be a botany, i.e. of the hidden meanings about Islam, they are more kuffar than the Jews and the Christians. In fact, they are more kuffar than the idolaters, i.e. the atheists and all these things, and their harm is far more grand than that of the Jews and the Christians and the rest of the Tatar and so on and so forth. So as you can see, even at the time of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, alayhi rahmatullah, and they were great opponents at that time there. Now, someone might say, okay, now these people are a deviated group, then what? Well, exactly like uh, Iran, for example, in the past, it was not a Shia country. It's when a small minority of a Shia took control of power, and that's how the Iranians got turned into Shia. And that is exactly what these people of the Alawian are doing right now. They want to turn Syria into a whole country of Alawian. Those who believe Ali radiallahu is a deity, is a god to be worshipped. And this is what led to the clash between this ruling family and the rest of the Muslims in the, uh, the land of Syria. Under Hafid al-Assad, the first president of al-Alawiyyin in Syria, a misunderstanding and a disagreement happened between or took place between al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin in Syria and Hafid al-Assad. Al-Ikhwan declared an armed appraisal against the then government. This armed opposition was declared when the father of Bashar, Hafid al-Assad, agreed on the passage of a law 49 for the 1979 year, which stipulates the execution of any who is found to belong to the group of Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, which he then called the change of this government. Meaning, in that year, in 1979, a law number 49 was uh, agreed by the government that anyone who is taken or known or belongs or even sympathizes with al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin will be executed without anything at all. Because this is the way for Hafid al-Assad to protect the Alawiyin and protect his status as a new dictator. Because remember, he came to power through a coup d'etat. Al-Ikhwan seized themselves in a city called Halab as their central command, and that's where they were, and they lived there. Al-Alawi president, Hafid al-Assad, was extremely furious and mad at them because the group had executed many of the Alawi heads, the big heads of the Alawi group. This happened because it was a battle between the Aqidah of Al-Sunnah and that of the Kuffar Alawiyin. It was that. Anyway... The attack day, it was on Eid al-Adha, after people had performed Salat and they were ready to go and slaughter their animals and everything. As the Muslims were 
exchanging visits and Eid Mubarak and all that kind of stuff, they got surprised by a bunch of army soldiers, special forces, tanks, and all that kind of stuff, and a fire got opened on civilians just like out of the blue. That was the retaliation of Hafez al-Assad. About between 80 to 100 people got killed out of nothing, just because someone killed some government. But that triggered so many events that happened after that, and they kept the repercussion until these days. To give you an idea about how deep is the argument and the disagreement between the Islamic population and the government is, I'm going to kind of like just tell you a few dates here just to give you an idea that it is not something new. For example, in 1979, 32 people were dead, killed, and 54 injured by an attack of the government on the civilians, on, again on the Muslims, on the Ikhwan al Muslimin. July 1980, 192 were killed by the government. Again in August in 1980, in another city, 35 people were killed. And again in August, in a place called Fortress of Halab, where about 1,600 to 1,900 people were killed and most of them were injured. But you know what the government did? It dug big graves and buried everyone, including those who were alive and they were the majority. So many, like tons of people died under the rubble of the earth. Half the Assad had buried more than 1,900 people. Most of them were alive. And uh, that really, really got into the blood of the Muslims because these Alawiyin, for more than 1,100 years, have been a sneaky killers of Al Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and their murdering didn't and wasn't to stop back in time. But then again, in 1980, another 2,000 people were killed just because a leader of Al Ikhwan was of that borough. Just like you kill 2,000 people because somebody lives in a place, and that was, but yet the ugliest didn't happen as yet. On February the 2nd of the year 1982, that was the bloodiest attack to ever take place, and that took in a place called Hama. Speculations that the number of people that have died is between seven to 40,000 people. And uh, what happened is really, really heartbreaking. The city got surrounded. All exits closed. Cannons placed all around the city, tanks all around cities, warplane, helicopters already, special forces, secret forces, heavily armed. And you know what happened? They started bombing the place and they ratified it from head to toe. There was no city when they fought. Do you know how long it took them? It took 27 days of continuous hammering of the city of Hama. Robert Fisk, who arrived to the city right after the murder took place, wrote to the English press saying that about 20,000 people had been killed. However, an American journalist named Thomas Friedman interviewed a general who conducted the operation himself and who is nobody else but the brother of Hafez al-Assad called Rifat al-Assad. The brother who boosted saying, I have annihilated 38,000 of those people. That is 38,000 of Muslims killed. And again, many of them buried alive. Those who didn't die. Another Syrian journalist called Subhi al-Hadidi wrote in 2002 that the number of unfound people on top of the 38,000 people was another 15,000 people. They didn't know where they went and how they disappeared. After half the Assad murdered the 38,000 people, his strategy changed from diplomacy to plain force. And since that day, for the next 47 years, until now, the emergency state was declared. When that bloody killings of 38,000 took place, you know what happened back then in 1982? No Arabs politicians spoke. No scholars of Islam spoke. No media of Muslim lands spoke. And the West did not speak. So much so 
that millions of people today, and probably are one of them, never ever heard of the great 38,000 massacre of Hama in Syria by Hafez al-Assad, just because these people refused Alawi, the one who believed that Ali is God, would rule them. And just like the Salafi school hated the Ikhwan in the 80s and they did not support them, the same thing happens today. The Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia and those who call themselves Saudi, uh, Salafis, they don't care about what happens just because the war out there is Ikhwan and the government. And I will cover this point a little bit later. It's uh, worthwhile knowing that the heavy retaliation of the Ba'ath Party under the leadership of Hafez al-Assad took place after a failed assassination coup against himself. The Ikhwan had masterminded an attack on Hafez al-Assad to exterminate him. And uh, they, they had this operation all running, and at one point, a grenade landed right in, in the lap of uh, Hafez al-Assad, and subhanAllah, it didn't explode, and he had to shoot it with his own legs. Look at the danger. It could have exploded. And then another grenade exploded not far from him, but one of his bodyguards, subhanAllah, was in the way, and Hafez al-Assad did not die. That triggered that anger in Hafez al-Assad, and 38,000 people paid for that attempt murder. Then for the long years that followed, Hafez al-Assad ensured that no Muslim, al-Ikhwan, nobody that is Muslim would open his mouth. A state of de emergency was declared and anyone could be stopped, uh, jailed, anything. You absolutely have no right whatsoever. And Syrian people became like sheep. They had no personality, no rights. A police officer can spit on your face and you have just to wipe that and you walk away with a smile on your face. Because if you say anything at night, you can rest assured there will be not a knock, but your door, the front door will be broken down and you'll be taken and you, nobody will ever hear from you again. And that's exactly what happens in Saudi Arabia again today. But in any case, how did these events of today Start, because you know in 1982, so there is an animosity between al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin and the Ba'ath or the Alawi party that still believes that Ali is a god. It started all in the Arabic Spring. It's called Arabic Spring because after winter, what happens is the, the forest and the land is dead. And then comes the spring and it brings life. So the Arabs have always been the poor guys and they have been always oppressed and stressed and everything. So they have no rights. They are just plain animals living on earth. And that was compared to a winter. Now comes spring and that's when the revolt started. And it started, subhanAllah, ironically, with the least expected country, Tunisia. And that is when a young man called Mohammed al Bouazizi, who was unemployed and he didn't, there was nothing going on for him. No job and no education, no money, nothing, nothing. And wherever he went, every door was closed. Again, remember, the government, the Muslim governments are not for the people, they are for themselves. So they will employ their family, and if you know somebody, you'll employ them, but the rest of the people are struggling. And that's what it is, and that's how it is today. So this young man, Mohammed al-Bazizi, took some gas and just went in the middle of a street and set himself on fire. And that, on that fateful day, the 17th of December, in a position, as I said, to his unemployment and the dire poverty that he was going through. On the 18th of December, 2010, Tunisians took to the streets. An anti-government protest started to show their anger against the government of Zin al-Abidin or Bali, Zin al-Abidin Bali, who later on, subhanAllah, when he was threatened, he piled up tons of money on his plane, and guess where he went? To Saudi Arabia, where he lives now like a king. SubhanAllah al -Azim. And you know what? You as scholar or the great number of scholars cannot open their tiny mouth to speak against this, even if Islam prohibits that. But obviously, the scholars of Islam are too busy prohibiting music on us and wearing the whatever above the ankle and the beard and the nails and the, the color of your hair and what you eat and how you even fart. They have fatwas for all this, but for the real issues, there is no fatwas. They are too silent. After Tunisia followed Egypt, 
and the revolt in Egypt started on the 25th of January 2011, which kicked the monster of uh, Husni Mubarak, the Un Mubarak, who was a open ally to America and to the Jews. It kicked him out of the ruling party on the 11th of February 2011. After that came Libya on the 17th of February 2011. After two successful peace revolts, again in Tunisia and in Egypt, the Libyans took to the streets and they say, well, let's get rid of Muammar al-Qaddafi, one of the most open disbelievers on earth. He is really an arrogant kafir with everything. He is, I can tell you, like a whole book, yet nobody ever spoke about him. And he went to Saudi Arabia for so many meetings and he was welcome to the land as a honorable, things like that, even though he openly insulted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But then again, the Ministry of Religious Affairs in Saudi Arabia is at the feet of the king. So they can't do whatever they want. So they have to follow the instruction of the king. Again, Al-Qaddafi was kicked out of the government. And I don't want to waste too much time on this here because I want to get to Syria. Again, in Al-Yemen, after Libya came Al-Yemen. And Al-Yemen's revolt started right on the same day where Husni Mubarak was kicked. And that is the 11th of February, 2011. A week later, Syria got started. Now, I want to tell you how the whole incident took place and how what triggered the whole what it is happening now in Syria, because knowing that will help us understand why what's happening is happening. In uh, Syria, there is a city called Dar al Balad, and there is a small borough called the, the Borough 40, Al Hayy Al Arba'in. This Dar al Balad is really on the borders between, very south of the borders between Syria and Jordan. There were a bunch of kids school, about 10, 11, 12 years of old, on those ages, going to school one day, and they wrote on the wall of the school, a shad you read is called a nizam. The people want to bring down the regime. And when that was seen by the police, what they did, they went into the school and arrested the young children. They took them to the police station and they tortured them. They started by taking the nail of every one of them from every finger in their body. Now that is a painful thing to do to a child. And then they tortured the children one by one and they kept them in jail. The parents didn't see their children at the end of the day. Where are our children? And then they heard that the police had arrested them. They went to the police station and wanted to get their children. It just happened that the brigadier general of that uh, department. His name is Atif Najib, and ironically, Atif meaning the one who has compassion, who is really merciful to people. He met them with an arrogant attitude, a threat, and he insulted them bunch and didn't even acknowledge their request and not even told them anything about their children. His attitude infuriated the parents. And they got really mad, obviously. How, of course, your children are being tortured. I mean, uh, how would you behave? When they showed some resistance, the government responded by an attack with helicopters and special forces. And you know when they did it? When the people were inside a masjid. It's called the Jami al-Umari, the Masjid uh, the, uh, of Omar. And a mass murdering took place on that day. From that place, the revolution got sparked. It started with Dar al Balad and it gradually went to the next city, to the next city, and to the next city. And the idiocies of this government, instead of trying to contain and talk and to people and try to appease things, they always responded with the hammer, the bullets, the planes, the cannons, the tanks, and everything. And he thought, just like his father, that he could get along and he can do whatever he wanted to kill the resistance. Yet, people, especially in this day and age with phone and uh, social media and all that kind of stuff people heard and it went on brace because people saw that what happened in Tunisia, in Egypt and in Libya, it was in, the, in El Yemen and then it was just like a sequence and it was the normal thing to happen, Syria was next and when the government started really killing people right and left and retaliating with plain anger, the Syrians had realized 
that the government was afoot to exterminate them. And at that time, they found out that there was a necessity to build a retaliation or a resistant army. And that's when al jaysh al-Suri al-Hur, the Syrian Free Army, was formed. And from that day onward until today, the battle rages on. So this is exactly what took place. Obviously, there are lots to say, but as I said, I want to keep this really simple and to the point. It was very easy and it was very simple for the revolt to spread because people have had enough. Lack of freedom, unbelievable amount of corruption at all levels. You couldn't really do anything without bribing somebody or without giving something and and you couldn't get anything done. In normal circumstances. And how is the majority of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah were being ruled by a governing body that believed Ali is a god? And that a people would eat in Ramadan openly, drink wine? How would you accept that? So the Muslims wanted to get rid of this cancer. But that cancer was a cancer. I want to tell you now how Bashar al-Assad came to power. Bashar was born on the 11th of September 1965. He became president in the year 2000, but he was not the one that was supposed to be president. It was a brother of his named Basil who was about to be a president, but his brother had a car crash. And at that moment there, he was the next one in rank. When his father died in the year 2000, something happened really peculiar. In the Syrian constitution, a president couldn't be a president until and unless he is 40 years of age. When Hafid al-Assad, the father, died, Bashar was only 34. In less than 15 minutes, the parliament changed the constitution from the right to become president from 40 to 34, and Bashar al-Assad was elected as president of Syria at the age of 34. I told you the Arabs can do a very quick job when it suits them, but if it suits you, it will take forever. Now, many of you do not understand as to why the world is doing absolutely nothing about what's happening in Syria. Either the West or the East or the Muslim lands themselves, why everybody is turning their head everywhere except to Syria. To understand this conflict, you must understand one thing. What individual people are showing us Muslims through the social media and what the government of Syria is showing the world And obviously these politicians, they believe more what the government shows as opposed to what the individuals show. And believe me, so many people do fabricate videos that come from Syria because they want to win their argument. And the government also does play on the video to make the world not think it's a big deal. And this is where the whole world seems not to be getting it because they look we look at different media than they look. We look at the propaganda that our Muslim people are making, and it's a big deal, and people talk. And the Bashar regime is using its own media to belittle the events as they took, and the world is separated between these two elements. Bashar Assad's ambassadors all over the world promote Bashar as he sees himself. He sees himself not a dictator. He believes he is a great leader who is less tyrant than his father. He is well educated and he fought corruption and bureaucracy and he did his best to raise the living standard in Syria. After all, he studied in England to be an eye doctor and he married a Syrian girl here who was born in England to Syrian parents. So he's doing his very best. Till today, Bashar refuses to communicate with the resistance because he can see them as rebellious people who abused his understanding and kindness. Had they used less violence, he would have listened to them. It's very peculiar how the rulers see the realities and how the world of people see the realities. This is, my dear brothers and my sisters, the picture that is being painted about Bashar al-Assad as a great leader. This is where the confusion is happening all over the world. Since 2011, more than 150,000 people have been killed in Syria. Now, my dear brothers and my sisters, that we know why the conflict is here and how the picture is being painted differently than what it is in the West, 
I want to say something. When you go on YouTube, you will see a lot of videos that are going to break your heart. But let me tell you this. So many institutions today will take advantage of what's happening in Syria and they will turn it to their advantages, namely charity organizations. Charity organizations, when they raise the money, for example, if you give them a hundred thousand pounds, they will take about 25,000 pounds for themselves and they will consider this as fees. Even if they pr promise that they're not going to touch their money, believe me, they will touch it because they will have all kinds of justifications as to why they took 25%. I do not trust any Muslim organizations. Let me tell you, a lot of the food that was sent to Syria to be donated for free to refugees was sold, and it was sold in dollars. Go on YouTube, and you see the amount of abuse. So please, please, please be careful. I will tell you, do not send money to Syria. Syria doesn't need money. Syria needs something else, and I will tell you of what I believe myself is the ultimate solution to the problem in Syria. But the solution, as I said, it is today that the Syrian revolt is seen differently by the politicians of the world and the people of the world. What's happening in Syria today is seen by politicians, the scholars, the politics, the rulers, to everybody out there as nothing else but a settling of an all record between al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin and the Syrian government. And just like the Muslim world, and the scholars included, kept a shut eye in 1982 when 38,000 people were exterminated to prevent Hafdal Assad from losing his chair or his position, the same thing is being done today, except today we have the social media and there is the internet that put things into the open. Back then there was none of this and it was hidden and as I said, tons of people do not know of that. And I will tell you why the world is silent just like it did back in the 80s and the 82. Because what's going on now is an internal matter. This is how they regard it. Pretty much as they regard what's happening in Mexico, for example, when there is a fight between the drug cartel and how the drugs are being uh, sent to the world. And the Mexican government is having a tough time with these cartels. It's an army against an army. The world doesn't talk about Mexico. Have you ever heard anybody speaking about the human rights in Mexico? Go on the internet, do search about the fight of drugs in Mexico, and you'll be amazed. You'll be surprised. And those people who use drugs are encouraging murders of people and spread of evil. But in any case, the world sees what happens in Syria as a account settling. It's a record settling. And this is why they don't want to interfere because they say this is a government that is trying to control the rebellion of its own people. Just like they didn't oppose the French Revolution, the British Revolution, and so on and so forth. Nothing is being done in Syria. Every government on earth, my dear brothers and my sisters today, knows that if the revolt in Syria succeeds, let's go to that scenario which they have already counted. If the Muslims in Syria succeed and they will topple Bashar al-Assad, take control of Syria, and the next day Muslims will be a power. Have you ever thought what's going to happen? Well, let me tell you what's going to happen and why the war in Syria is not going to end anytime soon. When Muslims assume will topple Bashar al-Assad and suddenly they become like everything is fine, even though they will not attack Israel, even though they will do absolutely nothing but rebuild Syria, but just the fact that Muslims have opposed a government and have actually succeeded in toppling a government and have actually succeeded in building their country and have successfully made the Syria far better than it was before, who do you think is going to be scared? The government states of the Arabs and the Muslim world. They will pee their pants. Right now, all over the world, in Saudi Arabia, who do you think is holding people down? Do you think Saudis are happy about what's going on? No, they're not. But who holds them down? The scholars that keep telling them going out against the ruler is a khawarij. You become like far and it's, it's anti-Islam. And people are confused. How come my king, their family drive Ferraris? Their families drive Porsches and the last and golden cars, cars made of gold. A prince buys a plane for $200 million. And Muslims are dying out of hunger in Saudi Arabia. Tons of people don't have where to live. 
And yet, you still cannot talk. You bring an army of Americans onto the land of Saudi Arabia, still you can't talk. The royal family does what they do. They do whatever they want. Saudi Arabia exists to serve the emirs, the kings, and the prince and the princesses. Yet, you cannot speak. This is why Syria will never, ever see the light of success. The same thing happened in Egypt. As soon as Sisi made his coup d'etat, Saudi Arabia sent him money, two billion or whatever it is, dollars, just to help him. Why? Because if the revolt succeeds in Egypt, it is going to rub on Saudi Arabia, and it is not in the benefit of Saudi Arabia that any revolt anywhere in the Muslim world should succeed. And Syria will not succeed unless we do what I tell you at the end of it. So that's one. So Israel will be highly in danger, and it's not going to happen. Israel is a rich country, and don't think anything. They are powerful and they are rich, and there are tons of people that support them. Even if you are going to do nothing to them, there is that element of fear. But the most important element why Syria will not succeed, why the Muslim world is not paying attention to Syria, why refugees come to Europe here and they have more percentage of becoming Christians and unbelievers, and why Saudi Arabia is not accepting the number of refugees as they are accepted in the West, because Saudi Arabia does not want, and when I say Saudi Arabia, I'm not talking about Algeria and Morocco, too, because these people are peanuts. It's Saudi Arabia who is leading the Muslim world, printing Quran and Khadim al Haramain and and sending us all these great scholars and making them famous online and everything, because they don't want the Syrian revolution to succeed. It will shake their thrones. So this, bear this in mind, big deal. And that re- the vision will become to you really clear. My dear brothers and my sisters, are you really crazy in thinking that the West will help Syria? Are you really thinking that the government of Muslim world will help Syria? If you think that is going to happen, you need a clap and a smack on the head to wake up because that is not going to happen. Always remember, if Syria succeeds, the next one is Saudi Arabia. And the Gulf doesn't want to do that at all. Look at the Saudi armies. They send them to Al-Yemen to kill their own brothers, and they give them titles. Saudi Arabia is professional in labeling people. You open your mouth to say something, they put you, you are an innovator, you are a khawarj, you are a mubtadi, you are this and you are that, and you are misguided, and you're going to hellfire. Subhanallah al-Azim. It boggles my mind how Muslims are being killed today and our scholars are really into a complete different out of this world realm. It's like they don't exist. What can we say? What can we say to Allah? We complain. To close this, uh, inshallah, Syrian eye opener, I want to say the following. That people who dream that the West or the East or the Arab governments or the employed scholars who would speak for the Syrian world and what's going on in Syria or for the number of the dead people, or the general hunger, or, 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 or. My dear brothers and my sisters, you are living in an unbelievable daydream. If you don't get it, let me spit it out for you in plain English. The West protects its interests, namely Israel, and supporting the royal families, because there is a lot of petrol, a lot of gold, a lot of wealth, a lot of business being done. This is why the West doesn't want to pay attention to Syria. The West protects Israel. The West protects and worships the rich. And the rich for now are the Jews and the Saudis. The East, Russia, is weak, as weak as it is feeble. It is working very hard to secure a share in future cake called the Middle East. This is why it's helping Syria to position itself for the future when the time comes to divide the cake, Russia will have a go and a share in it. The Arab Gulf states are more concerned about protecting their own kingdom, throne, and wealth than they care about you and me or even Mecca and Al-Madina. It helps them make money, and that's what it is. As for the employed scholars today, those pious people that give fatwa every two seconds that taking pictures is haram, yet you go on the internet, you find them smiling from the east to the west of their teeth, posing for the camera. But when you ask them for pictures, it is haram. Having a cat at home, it is haram. Drink tea, 
everything is haram. I don't know what is left of the halal. As for these employed scholars who work for the government, and they all know that Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, which they claim they follow very well, they know that all scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a have called any scholar that is close to a government agent or works for the government as dirty. Abdullah, the son of Imam Ahmed, Ali rahmatullah, asked his father, and this is in Al Musnad of Imam Ahmed. He told him, My father, a scholar goes to teach a ruler in his home. He told him, these are dirty people, my son. Plenty a hadith that you never get an opportunity to hear where Rasulullah prohibits a scholar to work for a government or to stand at the door or take any gift from government. Our scholars today are employed by the government. Do you know what happens? Let me tell you in brief center why, why in Syria we never hear a Saudi speak that is employed by the government because there are Saudis that have spoken and they are in jail. Still, we don't know what happened to them. When they were taken, when they were snatched, how they are tortured, and wherever they're going to be released, only Allah knows. To become a scholar in Saudi Arabia, you have two places, the jail or the university. At the university, they will teach you exactly, they will brainwash you into the Wahhabi or the Salafi school of thought. And one of the predominant thing is you must always, always bless the king and never ever say a word that's going to get people to demand their rights against the king. They will sing you every hadith that tells you, you give to your king his right. And even if he smacks your head and your back and takes all your belongs, you just observe sabr and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. So the king does what he wants. And we become his wives, whatever it is. <laughs> Allah Allah they have a funny way of twisting the text in Islam to their advantage. So these employed scholars, once they come out of the university, they get paid by the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And then you will tell and say what the ministry agrees, i.e. what the king agrees on, or you get fired. Have you ever wondered, and try this weekend, go on the internet, or go on the internet now on YouTube, and try to watch a khutbah of Jum'ah, where the Imam of Al-Haram in Mecca will stand the member and to deliver a khutbah. Watch how he reads from a bunch of pages, from paper. And that is how it goes in all of Saudi Arabia, subhanAllah, all those great scholars. The big sheikhs, the majesties of their eminence, those who are going to Jannah, they're going to just be with Allah themselves alone, the leaders of Ahl Jannah al Jama'ah. They cannot make khutbah from their memory. Do you know why? Because the government doesn't trust them. The government types their khutbah for them. And like parrots, they will get on the member and they will sing the khutbah, either they agree or they disagree with it, they have to say it. Do you think these puppets will speak about Syria? Do you think they will say a word to get Syria, to get the real world to speak about Syria? That's why you don't hear these, uh, these creatures talk about the truth. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our complaint against this. If you speak like this, they will tell you the flesh of the scholars is poisoned. You cannot speak about them. I'm sorry. These scholars are not prophets. These scholars are humans. These scholars are humans, and I follow him because I trust him. But as soon as I see that he uses Islam to political ends, I am really sorry. I've got better cows to talk to. So what is the way out from all this, my brothers and my sisters? Pretty simple. It's not marches in London. It's not. The next march should be to launch a revolt against those employed scholars. We must come out in London in a march, a very long march, where we say enough of the silence of the employed scholars. Why are you keeping quiet? We must pressurize the scholars to start talking. Because when we start demanding intelligently that the scholars of Muslim Islam, who Allah have trusted with this Islam, we ask them plain questions in the streets and it goes all over the world. Muslims in England, in the West, demand an immediate answer from the scholars of the Gulf and we have to pinpoint to Saudi Arabia because they have big mouths about the protectors of Islam. Those people who say Al-Ash'ari are not of Al-Sinaw Al-Jama'ah. That means the whole of Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia and Libya, all of them in hellfire. And Egypt as well, all of them in hellfire. People who are really expert in, in chasing everyone out of this Jannah to hellfire. We have, I, I swear to Allah, 
until and endless. We hold a revolt here, marches after marches to pin needle those scholars to open their mouths and stop being scared and apply the Tawheed which they teach us. They have to stop getting scared from humans. It's only then that the world will start paying attention to Syria. Friends of Syria in France or oh, the United Nations speaks. So since when the United Nations has done anything, nobody cares about the Jews and what they do. They're still doing and the nation is still singing. I tell you, the next revolt must be against these Salafi and Wahhabi scholars who have appointed themselves as protected of Islam. They read from a paper. They are employed by a government. They are employed by the king. These are the people who are really, really digging daggers in the big human body of Syria. Without that, forget it. Not amount of money. You know what? Let's say in England we get one million pounds. Huh. You know how many millions of pounds of the Saudis they waste in gambling? Go on the internet and type golden Saudi cars and you're going to see cars made of gold driven by Saudis. I can say a lot. A lot I can say a lot. But the time is getting late and uh, the stock is getting very, very large and uh, time consuming. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us with dua and uh, help us ease at least what our brothers and sisters are going through in Syria. And I tell you, it's not about sending money and it's not about collecting money. It's about pressurizing our scholars to come out of this deadly silence, to start talking. Either talk now or remain silent forever. Don't even one day tell me the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, because I won't believe you, because you've let me down when I needed you most, when my brothers and my sisters are dying right on that floor. Because you don't deserve to speak on the behalf of Rasulullah because when Muslims needed you, you let them down. You kept quiet. They were murdered and you didn't even say a word. You were still teaching people how to perform salat. Where are we and where is the command of Allah? I don't know anymore. I don't know. This is your brother Abdusalam Abu Hanifa with a heavy heart. This is a brief about Syria. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us get to the best of it. To join my WhatsApp group, just um, send me a message on 0787640 And before I end this uh, talk here, I don't insult the scholars. I love them and I respect them. I disagree with that they do. And I disagree with the vain, feeble uh, reasons they give to keep their mouths shut. And I disagree with them being employed by the government. And I know the scholars that we have are extremely powerful. They have big minds and big brains. They are just being limited by feeding their mouths. And I pray to Allah to liberate them from the grip of this royal family.